this Dr. Laurie with, uh, with us, Dr. Robert. Robert is a research scientist at Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, that is UFZ. And he's also a member of Global Young Academy, and he has been twice elected to the Executive Council uh, Executive Committee of the GYA. He's also a member of the Inter-Academy Partnerships for Poverty Eradication Committee, that is IAPSPEC. And he's also a reviewer at the UN Global Sustainable Developmental Report, that is SDG report. And it's a, one of the very prestigious report. And today, uh, Robert is going to talk a little bit about the SDG as well in a very funny exercise that you, you all, we all will have to do that through the chat box. So stay tuned. He has been earlier working as a Fulbright Truman Grant at the Yale University, postdoctoral awards at the European University Institute, that is EUI, Social Science Center in the Berlin, that is WZB, and Free University of Berlin, degrees from Oxford, LSE, and Hertie School of Governance, and currently working on the politics of the monitoring of the Sustainable Development Goals, DG, Science Policy Interfaces, and Environmental Policy. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Robert. And uh, today, along with me, uh, the, the co-moderator of the session is from Department of Environmental Sciences, Central University of Punjab. Over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Felix. Dr. Robert, we are indeed honored to have you as our speaker here and the Sustainable Development Goals, as uh, Dr. Felix mentioned in your introduction. It's something that is, you know, in the need of the hour to see. And I hope the audience are participants would be greatly benefited from your lectures, sir. So please begin, sir. Thank you, Punida. Thank you, Felix. And thank you so much for inviting me to uh, this biggest science uh, leadership workshop and science leadership program that I've ever seen. Uh, so I'm, I'm absolutely astounded um, about the great quality of the contributions and um, of the participants. So I'm, I'm deeply honored and a bit excited uh, to be here. So I will share my screen now. And I would like to talk to you um, about science communication for the sustainable development goals. So you already kindly introduced me. Um, so I'm just going to add a couple of things. So I'm a social scientist uh, with a background in philosophy, economics, and political science. I'm working at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Germany, a member of the GYA, um, and I do research on sustainability policies, specifically the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So you can see down there um, is a conference that I co-organized at the uh, German Academy of Sciences Leopoldina last year. There's a picture of the AC. And then on the bottom right, you see um, a, a screenshot of a TikTok, uh, which we will talk about in a minute, um, where I was at the UN uh, water meeting uh, about progress in monitoring the water related SDGs in Rome at the FAO. So, how to become a science leader in three steps? This is going to be very practical and there's gonna be homework. <laughs> so the three steps are, first, bring your family. Second, befriend an SDG indicator. And third, watch more TikTok. So this might seem rather mysterious, but I hope to explain it throughout this talk. And there's gonna be, as I said, three little pieces of homework or self-commitment involved in this. So I work at um, the U of Z, which is a center of the Helmholtz Association. And the Helmholtz Association is one of the biggest um, German research organizations involved in basic and applied research and strategic programs. You see on the bottom the types of things that the different centers are working in. And of these centers, my center is the U of Z, the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. And you see a picture on the right. And if you are ever in Leipzig in the east of Germany, please come and say hi. It's a, hi, it's a wonderful city. 
And you see here um, a, a map of the organizational structure of our um, institute. And that matters for this talk because um, I want to highlight this kind of thematic area that says environment and society, which is where I'm a research scientist in. So what we do is we do um, integrated environmental research. And the idea is that um, global environmental and sustainability challenges are so big that we can only tackle this if we do integrated science. So meaning that we include the social scientists and the natural scientists. So I'm a social scientist. Um, and I think there's around 150 of us in the Institute. And then there's about 1000 natural scientists working on chemicals, what are working on water, uh, doing biotech, modeling different things. But it's specifically this interlinkage between working with different disciplines and then engaging with policy and society. So the top of this scheme that I want to be focusing on today. So I'm also part of the Global Young Academy. I was elected um, to the Global Young Academy in 2016. And many of my, or some of my colleagues are also honored to be presenting in this uh, great science leadership um, program here. And you see the things that we, we aim at doing is to give a voice to young scientists around the world. And at the bottom, you see that one of our aims is also to collect resources about science leadership programs. So we are really listening attentively um, to this, which is the biggest program we've ever seen and learning a lot from it. And we want to collect different experiences from science leadership programs from around the world and then spread it so everyone can benefit from these programs. So it's great to have this freely accessible online. This is uh, some background about the GYA. Um, you can also read this on the website. I just want to point you to the button where it says uh, visit globalyoungacademy.net because there's an upcoming call for new members. And so if you're interested in becoming a member, um, you can see the application details coming up there very shortly. So let's get back to becoming a science leader in three steps. So I said, you should bring your family, you should befriend an SDG indicator, and you should watch more TikTok. So what is that all about? Well, bring your family stands for fostering a culture of kindness in academia. Before anything else, um, we need to make academia more kind. And I'm going to say how and suggest how to do it. The second point is to befriend an SDG indicator. So you know the sustainable development goals, but I think as a science leader, you need to be aware of policy. You need to understand policy so you, that you can change and impact policy if you want to do that. And lastly, watch more TikTok. It means exercising effective science communication. So I will talk about how you actually need to immerse yourself in the communicative culture of the day in order to make to be an effective science communicator. And maybe that's a little bit controversial, so let's have fun with it. Let's talk about kindness in academia. How might we make science more inclusive? So I tell you a little bit um, about me personally. So I'm a father of three young kids. Um, I'm a husband to a wife who's working full time. And there's, if there's one thing I'm proud of is that we try to divide our housework, household chores, and child uh, care equally, radically equally. And um, you see down in the bottom, there's a newspaper article where, where we had been, so my wife and I had been interviewed about what it's like to be a radically equal couple and um, try to make it in academia with kids and trying to make this care work visible and me taking paternity leave and part-time, working part-time and things like this. And I, I wish we, we lived in a world where that would be newsworthy. Worthy. So what, that would be completely normal to have an equal division of tasks. So I think we need to change men. We need to change institutions. And this is one of the ways in which I would like to make um, academia a little more kind. And there are many different ways to make academia more kind, to make it more inclusive. And recently we have learned, I mean, many we knew all along that it's important to make academia anti-racist and to be radically more inclusive of uh, underrepresented um, groups. And one way in which I try to do that and at the Global Young Academy is, for example, as a concrete step to think, how can we make academic conferences more child-friendly? 
So you see a list um, at the side of, of kind of a checklist asking how inclusive your conference is. And now you immediately see that this is a conference uh, a checklist from before COVID-19, when we were meeting in public in large groups regularly. And that brings me to the issue of paying close attention to the invisible care work that is going on right now in the pandemic, whether that's for young uh, parents in academia, whether that's for other people with caring responsibilities and caring responsibilities also for yourself, people who are affected, um, who have their mental health affected by, by the pandemic, even before, how to make this more visible in academia, how to speak more openly about this. And I would like to make it more visible, for example, by bringing the kids to work. That's what I mean with bring your family. So I said there's going to be homework. <laughs> My invitation to you is to do the following. So when I talk about fostering a culture of kindness in science, how might we actually make science more kind and exclusive? So if you watch this live, you can continue as you do. Um, if you watch this on a recording, please press pause in a little bit. And if you agree that this is an important goal, I would like you to write your personal SMART goal. So something that's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely in the comments below in the chat, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching this. And I would like to write you what you want to achieve, what, what you want to do in the next six months in order to foster a culture of kindness in science. So for example, even in the comments, I will lobby for better national parental leave policies. I will nominate scholars from underrepresented groups. I will create conditions of psychological safety in my lab. Anyone can do it and anyone can be a science leader in that regard. So you have one? Okay. That's the first homework. <laughs> Let's move on to the second one. Becoming, a friends, becoming friends with an SDG indicator. So the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are, I believe, still the best blueprint to safeguarding the planet, to staying within planetary boundaries, for making our world more sustainable. And we know that we are dangerously off track in achieving the goals in different contexts, uh, specifically the environmental and social goals. And I would really encourage you to read the Global Sustainable Development Report. Um, I was honored to be a reviewer of this report and I'm, I'm convinced that the, the call to action that I copied in here is very relevant for all of us. So the Global Sustainable Development Report outlines six entry points that offer the most promise in achieving sustainability transformations. So it's not just about incrementally making the world better, but actually achieving sustainability transformations. Very often when I'm being asked, okay, how can science contribute to the SDGs? Um, I see that people just do their research and then put an SDG number after it. So I do research on SDG 8, SDG 2, SDG 10. And I think we can do much better than that. So the, the first one, just putting a number to it would be SDG washing. I think science leaders really learn about policy. And that is, of course, if you want to do that. If you, it's totally fine to also be an academic scientist and focus on, on your research. But if you have the motivation to also be a public scientist, if you want to influence policy, I would strongly encourage you to become aware of policy. And so I'm, I'm going to walk you through what it means to befriend an SDG indicator. So you know there are 17 SDG goals. And if you look at the, at the screen, you see goal one and poverty in all its form everywhere. And below that, there are two targets, SDG targets. And these are the kind of the politically um, negotiated, globally adopted, not binding very voluntary targets that the entire world has signed up for. But then you see the indicators on the right-hand side, which are part of the monitoring framework. And that's actually where scientists have a closer affinity to. It's about monitoring. When do we know that we actually made progress towards the SDGs? So my invitation to you would be, and that's the second part of the homework, is to pause the video, go to sdgtracker.org, then pick a goal, pick a target, pick an indicator. So in this case, it would be 
I care deeply about reducing the proportion of people living in poverty in all its dimensions. So that's about multi-dimensional poverty. The idea that not just income deprivation is important when we're thinking about poverty, but the multiple overlapping deprivations. So lack of income, but also lack of adequate sanitation, housing, um, health, and so on. And the indicator is what puts this into practice and what and it says, when do we actually achieve that goal? And the importance is that this indicator is being used in different countries differently. It's translated differently according to the country, but also according to the region, even the city. So I would encourage you to not just look at this, but follow it up. So where, how, how is this indicator that you care about? It's your, now your friend. How is that being implemented in where you live or the place that you care about? So my invitation is to follow your friend wherever it goes, but be honest with your friend in the coming six months. So now that you're friends with an SDG indicator, what, what do we do with friends? We are honest with each other and we stay in touch. So who implements these indicators and how are they being implemented and with whom? And I think that's questions that science leaders should ask themselves and should ask of the SDGs. And I subscribe here to a theory of the relationship between science and policy informed by Roger Pilkett's Honest Broker, that the role of scientists who want to engage should be one of suggesting policy alternatives, suggesting options, making policy not science-based, so that kind of the science determines the political outcome, but knowing full well that the SDGs are a political document that involve lots of trade-offs and that necessitate societal discussion about what do we actually, where do we actually want to go? And so in a democracy, I think the role, and this is a very normative position, is that the role of scientists is to inform this negotiation and not to determine it. So in my view, a good science leader improves the quality of the political discussion by bringing in evidence, bringing better arguments. And this is a very concrete way of doing it. So you see a couple of pictures of, of what it means to become friends with an SDG indicator. On the right-hand side, you see um, how the indicators are actually, how the SDGs are implemented in, implemented in Germany. And becoming a friend means reaching out to the different governmental agencies to, at the UN level, to UN custodian agencies of the indicator or to policymakers and really follow up on these indicators that you are now not just an expert in, but also a friend with. And then you see, for example, in Germany that we have, of course, absolute poverty also in Germany, but also relative poverty. We have overlapping deprivations. But when you look at how that is implemented in Germany, you immediately see, so this is a picture from the German sustainability strategy, that they only look at income deprivation. So they miss out actually the ambition of the SDGs, which is about multiple inequalities and multiple dimensions of poverty. And so while I also work on that, and we just published a book that came out last week on dimensions of poverty, it's not enough to just publish something, but it's also trying to put this into the policy system, into the policy cycle, into the policy debate, um, and following up on that. So if you wanna go even further, and not all of you will want to, but I, I'm still gonna highlight this. I can recommend the following report by the Inter-Academy Partnership. Um, there are various ways to getting even closely, more closely engaged. It's for example, to contribute to your voluntary national review. So for example, India this year at the High Level Political Forum is due to contribute the, with the VNR and scientists can make their voices heard, you can approach policymakers, but you can also ask your university to sign the SDG Accord. You can join up with youth organizations that are youth led engage with different networks, write policy briefs, and importantly, not just make policy recommendations, but actually follow up on them. What happens to your recommendation? And all this requires to learn about policy first. So I hope you have your favorite, your uh, indicator that you're friends with now. The last point is a bit more fun. And it's the third step in becoming a science leader. And for me, it's about watching more TikTok. So what, what do I mean by that? I think 
scientists as a global community, we still vastly underestimate the power of social media for science communication, for science advice, but also for our very professional development. We th I think we underestimate that and we underappreciate that. And there are, of course, negative effects of using social media and problems associated with it. But I think we can do much, much more. And actually, this very workshop is an example of the potential for social media to scale our efforts, to scale good science, to scale discussions about science. And I would encourage you to engage more with it. And I wrote, watch more TikTok. I didn't just say post more on TikTok. And I'm going to explain a little bit why. And here you see the, the picture of a, it's a campaign of the British Library in London, where it says, if it happens in the library, it's research. And yes, I think social media is work. It's scientific work in a sense that you should take out time from your day to engage in social media and also encourage people to use it because it's vital, a vital contribution to the debate between science and society and between science and policymakers and uh, within science. Quite personally, um, I've been using social media consistently in the last years. And I, I can't even imagine to, to count the opportunities that have come through social media. So I've had invitations to keynotes, to um, asking people to contribute to conferences or submit articles um, through social media. And it's because I think a consistent engagement and consistent, not just posting and using it as a PR platform and pushing out your research and your findings, but trying to raise the debate, trying to lift up others, trying to post your article maybe 10 times, but then post the article of your colleagues and people that you admire 100 times and really lifting up others using social media also as a platform to foster kindness and to be constructive and to engage in scientific debate on this very democratic forum. So lots of people focus on the negative effects of social media and I, I'm fully aware of, of this, of the attention economy, of the commercialization of this, on the negative psychological effects, that's true. But I want us to focus much more on using it for good and using it strategically. Because in a sense, social media can keep us also humble. It can break our bubbles. And it, if we say more about social media, it can show us as humble scientists, especially if you don't just post your successes, but you also post your rejections, your failures, your mistakes, if you apologize for mistakes. This is the kind of thing that creates not just trust in scientists and trust in young scientists, but actually increases the trustworthiness of scientists. But it also can be used very strategically. So I'm a social scientist. Um, I often do interviews with policymakers and I just use, the, I think the most important figure for me is not the followers or the people that I follow or the number of tweets, but it's actually the messages inside Twitter because these messages are messages one-on-one -on -one behind the scenes. It means reaching out to people and breaking through barriers of hierarchy. You can, if you just post consistently, connect to basically anyone who's spending time on Twitter. And you would be surprised how much time policymakers, decision makers, leaders spend on these platforms. So for example, if you switch on the notifications of people you want to engage with, you see that some policymakers spend hours on there. So this is where the attention is. Sure, they might also read your journal article and by all means produce the best science you can. But also think about engaging consistently on social media and using it to elevate the discussion. And here, I think quantity is not a dirty word. It's, it's not at all. Instead, I would encourage you to post as much related science content as you can. The algorithm will take care of it. You will not flood social media. It's flooded uh, with, it's not, it, there's, there's simply not enough science on social media, but it's also fine to just sh show you as a human being and as a character. And very often in, in many contexts, and I've faced this myself, this activity is not viewed as you know, conducive to, to science narrowly understood. But I think 
it just means we need to understand what good science is and good science outreach. And in science, we often judge each other. Well, it's a system that's built on judging each other all the time. Peer review is core to our activities. And very often with peer review, we also have other types of judgments that are not scientific. And very often the way how we interact, how we reach out to people is also being judged. And I would invite yourself, I would invite you to care less about the judgment of others when it comes to social media and just experiment, find your voice. Okay. So how can we use social media more effectively? This is the last, the third part of the, the homework. And the question is, how will you, what will you do to use, uh, what will you do to communicate science better? So the last point is my invitation for you to again, pause the video if, you, if you're watching a recording and commit to posting a science related piece of content once a day or once a week, if you're less ambitious on all social media platforms of the day. So please write your self commitment below. For example, I will blog about science diplomacy on LinkedIn at least once a week, or I will create a Twitter list of young female toxicologists and highlight their research or I will start a podcast on inequality. And just like the other commitments in six months, so on December 26th or by then, I will check all of them and ask you what has happened in the meantime. Did it help? And I could, can already promise, nearly promise you that it will make a real difference to not just your science communication, but also how you view your science. Now, Closing this talk, um, I want to kind of present mixed advice that, that really helped me throughout the years in the sense that I, I looked at the other talks and I thought the most powerful ones were the ones that, that are a little more personal, that show you a little more as a kind of vulnerable uh, character. So um, I'm gonna make this quite personal and say that the first thing about science leadership that I learned and this comes also from you know, running science leadership programs, organizing them at the Global Young Academy, is that you can be a science leader from your couch. You can be a science leader from the playground. You have a phone in your hand. Many people have the phone in their hand to engage in conferences that you are not even attending. People are posting information about talks. You can follow it. You can make science kind of from from home, you can do it in industry, you can do it as a basic scientist, as a retired professor, as a lab assistant, anyone can be a science leader. I, I like to make it a habit to ask who's not included and why in events, um, in different scientific engagements. It's been, it's been a principle that has helped me a lot to broaden my horizon. Reflecting a little bit more about what good science leadership means for me is that good science leadership is adaptive. So yesterday already there was talk about being a good science leader it doesn't just mean leading from the front or from the middle or from the back, but it also can mean being a great first follower. So I love science leadership programs, but I think there should be many more first follower programs. So first follower is the first person who reacts to a great idea and says, you know what, that's a fantastic idea. I encourage you to run with it. Just don't listen to anyone else, do it. This type of encouragement is what I think good leadership is about. It's about being the first follower. This is something I learned in previous science leadership programs a lot. And good leadership is, I think, about adapting this, this position and this, um, this type of leadership throughout your career. And it also means maybe at some point you want to lead from the front, from the back, or want to be a first follower. And it's totally fine to be different types of scientists, also to have different types of public engagement throughout, throughout your career. The, the only possibly negative <laughs> advice that I, that I feared, but that has helped me a lot, is to try to steer clear of projects or people that drain you, drain you emotionally. And instead, double down on your strengths. Focus less on your weaknesses, because in science, it's all about really figuring out where your argument is weak. But in science communication, in science advice, in other aspects of science-related activities, double down on your strengths. Are you a good communicator? Then communicate. Are you good at bringing people together? Then do that. Introduce people to each other on social media. 
create value for others. Double down on your strength. Don't focus too much, spend too much time on your weaknesses. Life is too short. And that also means being kind to yourself. And with that, I mean being kind to your past self. So forgiving yourself for maybe not being as productive during pandemic times because there are more important things going on. It means being kind to yourself today in the present where you know who you are and you are humble about what you know and what you don't know. And it also means being kind to yourself in the future, not overburdening yourself with things that you actually don't want to do, not raising too high expectations of yourself, but acknowledging that science leadership is a really a lifelong activity and not a, a short activity. And it means being kind to others as well. So summing up, I think a science leader for me is someone who acts for the benefit of future society. It doesn't immediately need to benefit society, but maybe at some point in the future. And a last point is a great science leader, someone who does this, whether or not the system is ready for it yet. And I've been inspired by many, many colleagues um, also in this program who've been just that and I aspire to be one. And actually I'm also self-committing to my own homework. Thank you so much. Hi, Robert. It was really fantastic presentation. I totally enjoyed it. You, you emphasized so many points and you connected everything to the sustainable development goal and especially how to be a kind at home and uh, at the workplace. And, you know, it's everything about the science. It's amazing. Uh, you know, it's very relevant. And that kind of talk, somehow people are not really talking here. And I'm really happy that you're initiating uh, to start your podcast. You know, um, I'll be definitely tuning into your podcast channel. So... Yeah, so I'm going to share your talk and all other profile with my participants so they can be in touch with you. And whoever is interested, join your SD and other, uh, you know, the uh, program. So they will be happy to be part of your initiatives. And more than that, I'm really thankful to you because uh, it was only you who asked me to start a Facebook group. And our Facebook group, you're also a member of the group, I, I, I guess. We have lots of people and lots of ideas are being transmitted and I hope that uh, we are going to do it a, a nice job. But thank you so much for pitting that idea to me. It's an amazing idea and yeah, it's it's amazing talk. And uh, Dr. Punita, would you like to add some points? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir. Dr. Robert, uh, you know, I'm very thankful to you because it's been a very enlightening talk about the sustainable development goals and especially your way of explaining it to our participants and inspiring the young science leaders about the same. That has been really a wonderful talk. And especially your homework that you have given to us, that would encourage a lot of uh, brainstorming among the participants. And that too with the deadline of December 26th. I think that will make our participants more proactive, you know, for, for uh, all the tasks that you have assigned to us to follow till December 26th. So, uh, Dr. Robert, we have uh, very interesting questions by, by our participants. So, uh, the first question that asking is Dr. Indranil Samindra. Yeah, there is some problem. Uh, you know, anyway, it is in the chat box. So I think you have asking, How can an effective link, linkage be made between social science and environmental science? So am I audible? Yes, perfect. I see am you. I audible? Yes, thank you. Um, I think effective linkages is by um, by trying to do integrated research. And that means not just working together and then each of the different disciplines publishing in their journals, but actually trying to understand the language and um, thinking behind the different disciplines. And I often feel that interdisciplinary research where you don't fight, where there are no conflicts, isn't really interdisciplinary research, but it's kind of parallel research. So there needs to be a lot of discussion about actually the topic and different perspectives need to clash. And if you 
have that level of um, trust that you can talk with your colleagues about different ideas and different ways to see the world that I think makes environmental science very effective. It means, for example, um, asking, well, when you write something as a social scientist, ask the experts, natural scientists, in my case, that would be water scientists to really read your things critically. And then on my side, when my colleagues post policy recommendations, which they often do, is that I would ask them to, to ask the kind of the policy experts, okay, does it actually make sense? Is, is this realistic what we, what we are recommending here? And these kind of, kind of really checking in on each other and not just working in parallel, I think is paramount for good integrated environmental research. And for much too long, social science and humanities research and also the arts have been underfunded um, when it comes to environmental challenges. So I think there's lots of, lots of um, infrastructure and financial resources necessary to make this interdisciplinary sustainability science research happen. Okay, uh, Robert, I, maybe I should pick Dr. up one Felix? more question. Yeah, I can pick up one question here. The next question is about the SDG policy. Uh, does SDG policy beneficial to women or men? Uh, are men up being favored? Uh, uh, the question is by Anjana Srija. Is there any gender in SDG policy? So it's kind of strange question, but yeah. Mm, so a good, a good leader in science says when he doesn't know, and I don't know. So I know that there are good feminist critiques of the SDGs. And the point is that the SDGs are a political compromise. And if your perspective of the view, which I think is a true perspective, is that it's a patriarchal political system in most of world societies, then of course, an international consensus will also be patriarchal. But I don't know the details. I would have to read up on that in general. But what is good about the SDGs is that there is the attempt, especially at the monitoring level, to really break down what all of these indicators means for different types of people in terms of gender, in terms of, um, in terms of other kind of in age groups and so on. And so the spirit of the SDGs is to include all and to be relevant in all contexts. So that's the hope, I think. Yes, Dr. Bonita. Okay, <clears throat> Dr. Robert, the next question is from Namrata Pandit. Yes, uh, from Namrata Pandit, and she's asking, starting out to learn the fundamentals of science policies. That's, that's a great question. Um, so there is um, something called the SDG Academy, which is very helpful, which has lots of courses that are free, which are really connected to science policies um, related to the SDGs, which are interesting. And then um, I can also later on leave some links in the chat um, to, to create like a, a small reading list. Um, so I don't have to say it now. So um, the different approaches of how science, science policies can be done, different schools of thought, and I can do a, a small little syllabus. Yes, that would be really helpful, Dr. Robert. Now, let me pick up one more question here. I will also post that into the, your chat box. So you can see that. So, yeah. So Kanishka Srivastava is asking, uh, sir, how to motivate people to use social media for getting engaged in more science? Because mostly people are using social media to waste their time, hopping from the profile to profile and useless posts. Yeah, yeah. This is this is judgment, of course, about social media. And my um, my invitation is to think less about about wasting time on social media, but instead thinking about it as actually understanding how society communicates today. So I would actually increase the time you spend on social media, but do this more consciously. So if you if you look at your phone and you see TikTok, which I know is very popular in India, uh, it's also very popular around the world, is you, if you don't have it on your phone, if you don't use it, you don't understand how the next generation communicates, how they express their ideas. And you don't understand how they have capabilities of video editing that were unthinkable even a few years ago. And it's not just enough to 
to see it and look at it and enjoy it, but to actually immerse yourself in it, to understand it. It's also a sign of respect towards, I think, society to really understand how people communicate so that then you can communicate science more effectively. And yeah, if someone asks you, why are you watching TikTok again? You can just say, okay, Robert told me to. <laughs> okay. So the next question that is, uh, where, that would be very useful for, for our young scientists. And Anuj Bandral is asking, how to write a good research proposal with respect to SDG projects? Research proposal. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question and it so depends on your on your field so i i can only offer some very generic advice is to um to really think about what the ambition of the original goals and targets are and then map it to what's happening in policy so and how your research might contribute to that or inform that so how are national goals and policies implemented and how is kind of ambition lost across levels of governance, it's rarely the case that policy, environmental policy especially, gets more ambitious the closer it gets to implementation. Usually it gets less ambitious. And the SDGs are ambitious. So maybe one role is to show how your research can actually keep this level of ambition in the SDGs and help inform a good societal debate about different op policy options for sustainability. Okay, so here is a question from Dr. Kriti. He's asking, what is lacking in 17 SDGs? Are these getting updated, you know, annually or something? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, with, with 232 indicator, you would think that there are not many things that are lacking in, in the SDGs. But of course, because it's a political compromise, there are things that didn't make it. There's language about human rights and well, it's, it's, there's, there's some political language that wasn't acceptable at the international forum that's connected to human rights in there. There's of course new things like AI and like issues about how to make the digital transformation more sustainable and how to use the digital transformation for sustainability that isn't in there. There, there are many things that are were too critical that aren't in there and that's probably expected. Um, so the next question is by Akanksha Sharma, and she's asking, how can we bring together or collaborate qualities of a science leader and a social activist at the same time? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, um, especially as, especially in social sciences, um, the fight between being activist and you know how that impacts the quality of your research is a, is a debate that comes over and over. So the more you work as an activist, you lobby for something, uh, for society, does it impact the quality of your research? And it, that really depends. So yeah, I think you have to be first of self-reflexive, so really think deeply about what you care about and um, be honest on whether that impacts the quality of your science or, or not and keep an open mind. Um, but generally, generally speaking, I think that scientists can learn much more from NGOs, for example, than they used to in the past. So especially in the SDGs, I, I saw very few good critiques and constructive insight from academics over the years. But it was the NGOs, also the international NGOs, that were so on point understanding exactly how the policies work, where to intervene, and then also what what kind of scientific insight matter for the political level. So this kind of realism about the science is something that NGOs can bring, that social activists can bring. So I think it's absolutely necessary to be in open conversation with NGOs as often as possible, much more than before. Okay, so let me pick up a question here from uh, Vitabrata Malik. Vitabrata is asking, how accessibility can be linked with sustainability as per SDGs? 17.7 .7, especially for elders that's a great question um i don't know <laughs> i don't know okay over to you okay 
so the next question is by Shubham Jyoti Nayar, and he's asking, what according to you can be the role of non-strategic factors in the sustainable development goals regarding the third world economy? Could you sorry? Could you repeat that question? I only got. Ah the... uh, yes, sir. So the question is, uh, what according to you can be the role of non-strategic sectors in the SDGs regarding the third world economy? The the role of non-state I mean, sectors. More, the role... It's more for third world countries. Non-strategic sectors. Oh, I see. Um. Yeah, that's. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. I will have to defer on this question as well. Yeah. These are good questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yes. okay. So let me pick up one more question here. How can we bring oh, together? Oh uh, no, this is yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So Ansuya Nagaraj is asking, how far sharing and spreading scientific knowledge in social media inspire the people's mind? In what way they knew about it? And can you speak something about uh, post-truth, the fake news, which is actually spreading in the social media? Oh, yes. Um, so some of my research is connected to uh, nudging and the idea how to use psychological insights to make better policy. And um, there is some really interesting interventions going on on how to spread, uh, how to not spread, how to combat misinformation. And one very effective strategy that I have seen also in the peer-reviewed literature is the idea of um, inoculation. So the idea that you already prepare people for the fact that they might in the future um, receive false information. And in experiments, it's shown that, that that helps people being more aware and more attentive to not sharing, for example, uh, the impact of Corona and 5G and, and things like that. So, but I think for this, you always need ethicists and social scientists to think, okay, how do you use these psychological insights in a legitimate way? And I think a good way to ethically do these interventions, these psychological inoculations or whatever else you find is to be on the platforms and to be a trustworthy person and to have a record of speaking the truth or trying to speak the truth of trial and error of trying things out of being wrong having a track record of being wrong and admitting to it makes you a trustworthy person and i hope that scientists can play a role in this in the fighting the spread of misinformation by being truthful selves on social media that's very idealistic but that's my hope Fantastic. Cognitive immunization, isn't it? Yes, I have featured this in one of my programs. So, great. Ah, that's where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Panita. All right, so I love it. Sir, a very interesting question has been asked by Srishti Mishra, and she's asking how to connect people with environment in developing countries, uh, where how to become a UN member to work. I only got the first part of the question, sorry. So the, the question is how to connect people with environmental yeah, related how issues to connect, connect. In, in developing countries. Yeah, that's... Where that, that, we have large issues. Yeah, that's one member to work for environment. So I posted in your chat box. Yeah, that's that's a really important question. And the SDGs, of course, allow for different policy priorities in different countries around, around the world. And quite often in less resourced countries, environmental policy policy hasn't been on top of the priority. However, in my research, what, what I see is that actually the SDG monitoring framework has made a tremendous benefit um, to the attention of environmental uh, issues in around the world. And this is because for the first time, for example, if you look at the water quality indicator 632, so my personal friend, is that actually 
by asking every country to report on progress on the SDGs, this awareness about environmental pro uh, problems is raised. And the interconnectedness of environmental, social, and economic problems are being shown through this monitoring program. So I have hope that the SDGs actually provide a good mechanism for making these interconnections that we so dearly see visible. So here is a question from Priyanka Sarkar. How to encourage public private partnership to address the SDG one, no poverty using natural resources management? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And it, it points me to the fact that I haven't really talked about businesses and the private sector and the SDGs, which from a financing standpoint is of course crucial. So this would be another, another science leadership workshop on how to engage industry and uh, commercial entities for implementing the SDGs. And they're of course vital because it's the way we produce and consume that is, uh, has uh, brought us into the mess we are in. So engagement with the um, with private sector is, is hugely crucial. And I hope subject to future work of mine, hopefully. Yes, yes, Dr. Panita. Okay. Uh, so uh, I would be asking the la la uh, the last question of this session that is by Tia Sharma from Punjab, and she's asking how to encourage the students of environmental science more towards the uh, implementation of sustainable development goals. So I have high hopes for the students of environmental science because they picked uh, environmental Shall I repeat science. the question? No, no, I got it. It's great. It's a great question. Um, so okay. students, students, okay. whether it's men about making science more accessible, where, whether it's about making science kinder or advising science uh, policy better, I think students are a big hope. So it's important that especially non-students, uh, postdocs and young professionals really use uh, the students um, and like learn from the students in bringing about change in academia and science and in policy. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And uh, I, I know that from many people that are featured in your science leadership program are, I, I want to aspire to be someone who includes students in these endeavors. And yeah, I think that's, it's, it's vitally important. So they, and I don't think they need to be encouraged even further. They are already encouraging us and we need to listen to them better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So okay. I will also pick a last question here. It's from Urmila Chakraborty is asking, what contribution do incul inculcating moral values in the scientists add to the fostering cultural kindness? Yeah, so in, in a science leadership program that I attended before, um, I learned that it's not just about um, knowing that people have different values and being diverse, but also that you have a cultural dexterity. So that means um, getting involved with people who have different opinion than yours, changing your opinion, changing your mind, and uh, opening up the bubble that you are in is, is very helpful. Um, and I, I think, um, being asked to explain your values and your morals to others helps in understanding the perspective of others and helps to foster kindness. So seeking this kind of engagement and trying to maybe use social media in good faith can help in that. I know there's lots of toxicity and hate and, and trolling and this is all there, but maybe you and you are following, you can be different and you can be kind and you can be open to different perspectives. And that will make you not just more diverse, but also give you cultural dexterity in different contexts. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Robert, we are really thankful to you, you know, for sparing time for uh, this lecture. And we understand that it's totally voluntary and, you know, encouraging all the participants of this, enlightening them about the SDGs and you know, assigning them tasks and homework so that they become more proactive in this. It has really been a wonderful session. And I'm sure all the participants would have benefited from this lecture today. And I would like to thank you from the core of my heart. It's been a wonderful lecture and I have learned a lot from you today, sir. And I thank all my participants also who are listening to this lecture via YouTube. 
and uh, dr phillips please add something to it yeah uh, robert it is really wonderful to have you i'm i'm seeing you for the first time i have been communicating with you for quite some time through the facebook chat as well as through you know the the emails and yeah to see the face to face is really interesting and thank you so much you know you did a great job today with us you really spent one hour and uh, of course before actually you know you you came uh, uh, well at 12 for, uh, 12:45 i can say uh, and testing out the matter you know things and really thank you robert it's a fantastic and i'm really inspired by your kindness you know the way that you deal the matters and uh, you are you're working to to foster the kindness among the scientific community that's really appreciable a trait thank you so much robert thank you i'm honored glad to have you here thank you doc i'm honored thank to be you. a participant in this thank i'm you. excited about the next uh, the next speakers thank you thank you sir yes so we have our next speaker let me share the screen uh sad So our next speaker is Professor Magdalena, uh, you know, and uh, Professor Magdalena Skipper is uh, editor in chief of the renowned journal Nature. So uh, let us meet her at exactly 3:30 p.m. and she's not going to use any slide; it's more interactive. So keep watching. Okay, see you at 3:30 p.m. today. Goodbye to all. Goodbye.